Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right. Um first of all, I would like to thank you. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for coming. Um especially the organizer for um organizing this event which is um Sudut Pandang and also Arus Baru. So this forum is actually organized by Sudut Pandang and Arus Baru. And for tonight, we are going to talk about a very interesting topic, uh, which is liberalism in multicultural Malaysia, a solution or threat. So for tonight, we have uh, brought to you two um, prominent um, speakers or panelists for our forum tonight. So before we introduce the speakers, um, a bit of introduction of our forum. Um, when we talk about liberalism, um, it has been uh, an interesting thing to talk about nowadays, uh, especially today. And it has been some sort of uh, an argument or some sort of an idea that people today are more uh, likely to be more liberal and it is as if like it is more okay and it is more positive to be liberal rather than not. If you are not liberal, then you are actually conservative, as if like that. Okay, and also, it is also interesting to talk about liberalism because it en encompasses a range of things. Um, in different um, sectors, I mean, in different things. So, for example, when we talk about um, politics, it is associated with democracy, or I don't know, is it? Um, in economic, it also it is also associated with um, international trade, um, freedom to trade, or um, what do you call that? Globalization. And also socially, we talk about individual rights, freedom of expression, freedom of media, and so many things. So when we talk about liberalism, it is interesting. It, is, it sounds like positive, but at the same time, it is quite confusing. So as a start for this forum, uh, we would like to clarify what liber liberalism is all about. So I'm going to ask our panelists, um, to explain about liberalism. But before that, before I, I forget, um, let me introduce our panelists for tonight. So on my left hand side uh, is um, Ahmad Farami Abdul Karim. He is a fellow at the Institute of Journalism Studies, UITM. Um, his specialization is in media studies. Uh, in broadcasting, media management, and documentary filmmaking. His experience, um, he had uh, worked uh, in many places um, and had done script writing, script editing. Um, he had been a, an assistant producer for various genres and program types. And I guess it's for different channels on different, yeah, different platforms. Um, his academic background, his degree and master's degree was in media studies. So we can say that our first panelist for tonight is an expert in media studies, and is an expert in journalism, and is, he's very, very good at understanding about media and how people of different parties, of different organizations actually utilize the media that we have today. And it is more interesting to talk about media today because we have more channels or more platforms um, to reach out to people because media, as the, the word itself, itself is de uh, defined, that it is actually a range of options or channels uh, for people to interact, for people to uh, express ideas or, and also to transfer information. So I'm not going to talk much about that. So our speak, our panelists will explain about that later if he has time. So <clears throat> our second uh, panelist for tonight is uh, 
Dr. Noor Hazlin Hazrin Chong. He is uh, currently a lecturer at UKM. Uh, he, she, sorry, she, sorry, uh, she had a PhD. Uh, she has a PhD in microbiology from the University of New South Wales, Australia. Um, and what's interesting about our second panelist for tonight is that she recently had attended a forum organized by IDEAS, which is the um, Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs uh, in KL recently. And from that event, uh, she had been a spotlight from the media saying so many things, uh, including you know, some I quote from the media saying that um, she is uh, she rejects freedom of, of expression, and also um, from some some Chinese media also stated that she is uh, uh, she stated that they said that she, they said that she said that um, Malaysia will be more peaceful by restricting non-Muslims' freedom. So. These are so, the things that the media is talking about her right now. So it is very interesting to have her tonight and up in this forum. All right, so I'm not going to waste a lot of time. So we're going to continue with our first round. So we want to understand um, liberalism. So we're going to ask Dr. Haslin, um, liberalism in um, political context, um, can you explain um, liberalism as a political movement and its development institutionally at the global scale and also domestically. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, organizing committee for having me uh, in this discussion. Um, right, I'll just jump straight to the um, to the question that uh, Akbar um, just asked me. So in terms of political movement, right? So um, liberalism itself is, is a school of thought, okay? It's a school of ideology. And um, I think all of us here, and especially ISMA members, has already uh, been educated uh, on its history um, in terms of its uh, origin or roots, you know, being from the 17th or 18th century where you had the uh, age of enlightenment being the one of the um, origins, I guess, uh, that gave birth to liberalism. Um, and it stands on the notion of liberty and equality. Um, you know, they, they have that they, as their rhetoric, right? Liberty for everyone and equality for everyone. And it was, I'm just, you know, reiterating the history, it was an escape from, from the um, authority uh, being that that time the church, right? The church was the governing um, government for for the people, okay? Or also the monarchy um, being or having the absolute power to um, govern the country or the society. So they're actually escaping from that, and um, you know having these notions of liberty and equality. So liberalism as well, we we know that they are um, advocates of freedom of thought, freedom of religion, freedom of speech and expression, um, democracy, um, free trade, uh, what else? Uh, you have also economic liberalism, where uh, the free markets okay, uh, uh, are derived from. You have democracy, gender equality, and so on. So um, they all have this, um, I guess, you know, this is the whole sort of philosophy that uh, liberalism uh, preaches, okay? So in essence, um, its whole idea is to run away from, you know, from converse, uh, converse, uh, conservatives, right? Conservatism, um, state re religion, or having some authoritative power like the monarchy um, to actually control the society. So in essence, um, liberalism is already a political ideology in itself, right? So when a political party or a, a country or society adopts and develops uh, uh, liberal liberal ideology. You can al already call itself a liberal party or, li uh, or a liberal society based on the principles that I um, touched upon just now. Right, freedom of rights, freedom freedom of uh, speech and expression, and so on. 
And so, sorry to interrupt yes. a bit. That's so when you say that they adopt, do they actually adopt um, the ideology or do they actually advocate and promote the ideology? So how does yeah. it work actually? Uh, yeah. Well, adopting meaning uh, living by the principles, but to an extent, right? Um, and also, yes, dis disseminating and promoting their, their, their principles and the way they think freedom, how freedom should be uh, in their context, in their, you know, in their frame of mind, right? But, be, but we all know that Islam already has its own freedom, right? But the freedom that uh, liberalism uh, preaches is, is their version of freedom, which uh, to an extent, uh, Islam would not accept because it goes the, against the boundary or against, against the uh, principles of Islam. And uh, that that is already outlined from the Quran and Sunnah. Yeah, so that's uh, that's another thing um, interesting uh, that is interesting to talk about. So you said that Islam promotes freedom, uh, but also they also promote freedom. Yes. Yeah, but we do not. I mean, Islam do not accept their kind of freedom because it um, it would reach a certain boundary. So if we have that boundary, so do you say that we have that freedom or how do you actually explain freedom in Islam? Some would argue that, uh, okay, because there's freedom in Islam and, um, and that, you know, you can actually call yourself a liberal Muslim because, you know, there's freedom in Islam. But the thing is, fundamentally, um, fundamentally, liberalism has the individual, human individual, as its main faculty of decision making, uh, or you know, uh, um, you know, uh, make the individual responsible for every action, right? But we know that in Islam, uh, the freedom that we are uh, okay with is the freedom that is given uh, by Allah in in the form of you know, a Quran and Sunnah, right? So, I'll, I can talk about a bit more with that, but then to, to address the question, right, in terms of the political development, right? Uh, so, from the West, so it, it has, I mean, the liberalism ideology has flourished from the West since the 17th or 18th century, and for, for now, you can expect that it's, it already matures uh, globally, okay? You have um, the biggest institution of liberalism called Liberal International, where it houses a uh, hundred or more over liberal um, parties, liberal think tanks, organizations, and so on. So you have the uh, Liberal Party of Canada under Justin Trudeau as the Prime Minister. You have uh, Liberal Democrats in the UK. You have the, uh, I think, uh, Democratic Party in the US and so on. So they all are actually under, you know, liberalism, right? Um, you also in Europe, it's it's already uh, known that um, you know uh, countries like the Netherlands, for example, have uh, liberal parties that allied with socialist and social democratic parties, forming coalition um, that's called purple purple coalition. Have you heard that legalize same sex marriage, um, prostitution even, and also uh, non enforcement policy on marijuana. So. That's how that's how they are already developed right now. Okay, um, but in Asia, uh, specifically in Malaysia, it's still a new thing. Um, it's it's still quite a new uh, political ideology, um, but it's beginning to emerge, beginning to take place. And you have uh, you know various institutions like IDS, the one that you mentioned just now, um, promoting classical liberalism ideology. Um, and it conducts, you know, closed door seminars and also conferences. The one that I atten attended last week, um, and interesting is funded. Interestingly, it's funded by um, not just local but foreign um, entities, being about seventy percent, and that shows you how um, you know there are foreign interest in promoting this liberalism ideology into Malaysia and. And I suspect also throughout the whole Asia, where it's still you know relatively new compared to the West. Can you give more examples of some other organizations or even political parties that you think are um, uh, liberal? You know? um, uh, 
it's kind of vague, but then because you know, uh, there's one, there are a few uh, organizations, but they don't really uh, declare themselves. Uh, you know, I'm a liberal, especially, <laughs> especially with the, um, uh, especially with those who are who are Muslims themselves. You know, it's it's kind of a sensitive subject, but that. Yeah, I, I but uh, last time in, in in the forum that you attended, someone actually, if I'm not mistaken, one of the panelists actually said that he is a preacher of um, liberal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So he, and he's a Muslim, and yeah. So we can see like the development there, where you know previously be, they may be you know not going out and saying, oh, I'm a liberal sure. person, but now okay, I'm a, an Islamist and. I'm I'm preaching liberal. And yeah. saying it well, loudly. I can safely yeah. say, in, uh, Sheikh Khalid Jafar. I mean, he himself, um, you know, proclaimed himself as a liberal, pendawa liberal. Okay, <laughs> and he's from Institute Kajian Dasa. So you know that, um, you know, those organizations have that uh, particular orientation uh, towards, you know, towards liberalism, but. Uh, but ideas is, is one such example that's clearly um, you know freely promoting itself as a liberal organization. All right, thank you. Um, I think we yeah it is interesting if we can list down <laughs> all the organizations that we think as liberal. But yeah, we may want to um, continue with our next panelist. Um, so we have understood how liberalism. Uh, uh, had developed um, socially or po politically, uh, and, and how it came down, you know, from the Western world to Asia and um, specifically to Malaysia. We now we want to understand how liberalism, um, as an ideo ideology itself, is problematic. So we would like to ask our second panelist: um, Can you? Define liberalism um, as an ideology, its ideological basis, and it, can you elaborate on its um, problematic? I, it depends. Uh, I would say problematic um, ideological construction. Assalamualaikum <coughs> warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I would like to start by thanking the organizer for having me. Uh, um, Thank you, Jack. Well, well um, liberalism is, is uh, a complex term, actually. You know, I mean, it's very difficult for us to, to simplify it or to reduce it to, you know, explaining it by using several words. Um, there are many ways of approaching the subject of liberalism. You know, um, it's a slippery concept, which means that, you know, it, the meaning of the word changes according to your, to your uh, point of view. Um, liberalism as a political movement or political thought revolves around, as, as what Dr. has been said just now, ideas such as um, free markets, free individuals, limited government, you know, um, they claim that liberalism uh, advocates ideas such as um, civil rights, uh, notions such as gender equality, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and basically, liberalism is against uh, forms of what traditional conservatism, including state religion. Um, one of the most popular theorists or thinkers associated with li liberalism is the, uh, the 17th century uh, philosopher, uh, John Locke. Uh? Uh, he was the one who actually promoted his idea in, in a very active manner and uh, the idea became rather popular during the Age of Enlightenment as what uh, Dr. Asrin mentioned just now. And um, it was propagated, promoted by economists and philosophers during that particular era. Um, today, it's one of the most influential political traditions, political philosophies. And uh, you know it's practiced in, in in various forms, including social liberalism, um, in different you know places, you know, you know, like Canada just now, like what Dr. Arata has been mentioned. But I think we are more concerned about the kind of 
liberalism, which is causing problem in Malaysia, liberalism in, in a more um, basic sense, you know, liberalism as an ideology which seeks to reject any forms of system, authority, moral and social control which are based on Islam as the religion of federation or which are based on Islamic law and, and, and injunctions. Right? And I think that's how we should frame our discussion by looking at liberalism in, in that manner. You know? So that's easy for us to, 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 to describe it, to, to explain the kinds of situations and conditions we are, we are in huh? oh. during these times. And to, um, yeah. yeah, sorry <laughs> to interrupt. Sorry. So, do you believe that um, the the limit uh, the the limitation? I mean, you saying that free, uh, liberalism in Malaysia in the context of they are uh, not agreeing with having authorities from you know religious religious basis. So are, are you saying that just Islam or other religions as well, or how how do you see it? Generally, it is antagonistic, it is against the idea of the state having any role in the practice of religion or in religion, you know, religious affairs of any particular community. Um, in the context of liberalism in Malaysia, we have many political movements, NGOs, I think they are advocating for the idea of secularism, a state policy, or the principle of governance which separates the state from, from any particular religion. And that's one of their uh, advocacy, right? Um, and we've been hearing how you know, certain NGOs coming together, proposing for you know, some kind of radical changes in a society, even pressuring the UN to start giving pressure. Huh? Um, so that our authorities will repeal or abolish certain laws such as um, anti-cross-dressing laws, anti-anal sex laws, uh, even the um, demarcation between boomies and non-boomies in Malaysia. To them, it is considered as against the idea of equality and justice, you know, because political as a political movement, what they're trying to, to pursue is the idea of a state which is neutral towards any forms of religion or any communities. And of course, that is basically against uh, our constitution. Uh, to me, uh, personally, I think it's unconstitutional. And therein lies the problem. Uh? Th that is quite interesting because I think um, we have seen before some um, politicians, um, I mean, and there is an example actually, a politician um, from the opposition side. Um, she actually um, wanted to register her child as Bangsa Malaysia instead of a certain race because her husband is an Indian and she's a Chinese. So she wanted to, you know, put because in Malaysia in the IC we have we ha have our race in the in uh, put in the um, uh, birth cert and also in the I um, identification card. So yeah, she pro she advocated for having Bangsa Malaysia instead of um, certain race, whether the father or the mother. But at the same time, um, it is also quite confusing because when you uh, when she named her child, there is a Chinese name in it. So what? Yeah, it is confusing for me. What what sort of identity that we can create if we have this? You know, um, religionless or raceless um, identity, pers personality. So, yeah, maybe you can elaborate more on on how would be the consequences uh, in in Malaysia by you know having this kind of um, thought ide ideology. I think what you were referring to just now is the uh, you know I I hate to use labels, but in this case you know we have to use the label radical multiculturalist, you know, the kind of movement, political movement to be exact, which seeks to reject any forms of um, association you know, of the, the, the nation with any particular community identity. Huh? 
And uh, it seeks to neutralize um, any forms of ethos or particularistic uh, elements which associate a country with a particular community. So their utopia or their imagination of um, a perfect state, no? a Malaysia without an identity which favors a particular uh, ethnic community, which is rather impossible, it's unrealistic, you know, a country, a nation state is built, is created around a particular identity and, 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 and you know, normally it's associated with uh, the uh, dominant group. And in, in our case, of course, the Malay Bui Putra. This is clearly described in Dasat Buddha and National. It is clearly described um, that uh, our identity is closely connected to the um, anthropological as well as sociological basis of our country, as well as historical, to be exact, and also social, socio-constitutional uh, uh, basis. So I think that's a rather impossible task to have a country which is free of any identity. Uh, that's that's unrealistic, um, an unrealistic utopia. Thank you so much. Um, that's a very interesting round um, of the forum. So we have tried to understand the definition of liberalism and the development of it um, politically in, in uh, Malaysia. Um, so now we will continue um, in this forum. We go, we're going to talk about the topic, which is multiculturalism. Um, so we're going to ask again our um, uh, uh, panelists here, uh, Parami. So why liberalism is fundamentally flawed in addressing multiculturalism, and how would you elaborate on the outcome if it is adopted and practiced in this country? Um. As we have discussed just now, liberalism is inherently problematic because it is not a reflection of the nature of our country, our the demographics in Malaysia, um, being you know majority Muslims being the, the the dominant demographics in Malaysia. I do not think they appreciate and share the same sentiment like the minorities uh, who are actually proposing for you know liberalism. Liberalism, this is my argument is actually propagated by a small group of you know minorities of people but they have their voices have been amplified reinforced by the liberal media and certain political movement um, but in reality they are an insignificant group huh? uh, but their voices have been again amplified huh? by certain uh, news portals and these news portals give the impression as if they are actually representing the majority uh, of the people in Malaysia. So I think that is why liberalism is problematic. It is not representative for the interests of the majority of the people in Malaysia. It is against our, our federal constitution. Um, our federal constitution is not neutral towards religion. Uh, it favors uh, Islam uh, as its... Um, um, religion of the federation um, and liberalism, uh, liberalism is fundamentally against uh, the idea of state religion uh? so there will be many problems if if liberalism is implant, implemented as our dominant ideology i don't think that that, that, that will happen but um, we you know we will still be facing um, the kinds of onslaught which we're experiencing now by this community because of the the, 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 the influence of you know, liberal media, especially the news, the few news portals, uh, which amplified their voices. Um, and of course, liberalism is also against, or is you know, an antithesis to Dasar Kebudayaan and National, uh, which clearly states that you know, Malaysia has an identity. Um, and, and, and of course... Can you um, explain more about Dasar Kebudayaan? Dasar Kebudayaan yeah. National basically describes how Malaysia has an identity, identi an identity which is closely connected to the Bumi Putra, uh, to, to the Malays as the um, um, dominant group, uh, um, Bangsa Teras, and also kebudayaan or cultural values which come from the Malay archipelago, Kukusan Kepulauan Melayu. That should be our main identity as described in Dasar Kebudayaan National. So it's, it's, it's a myth, you know, if you think that you know, Malaysia has no particular identity that Malaysia is multicultural in that sense, you know, 
multicultural is perfectly fine. In fact, we should celebrate diversity. Huh? We should we, we celebrate um, religious diversity as well as um, you know cultural diversity. Multiculturalism becomes a problem when it seeks to erase or reject any forms of um, national identity which are connected with certain groups of uh, community, uh, or in, in this case, uh, the Bumis, uh, the Malays. Uh, so it becomes a problem because it goes against Dasar Kebudayaan Nasional and in many ways, Perlembagaan Persekutuan or Federal Constitution. So you are saying that actually liberalism will actually erase the identity of a country eventually, or how does it work? That's that's you know multi, multi radical multiculturalist uh, in expressions or manifestation of liberalism, and what multiculturalism does is that it tries to erase our sense of history, our sense of identity, or, and even our sense of future uh, by proposing that you know the government or the state should be neutral, uh, should, should be neutral, should should form. A, a normative neutrality when it concerns um, cultural, cultural expressions and also national identity. That is impossible. A nation state is characterized by the language and culture of, of, of its dominant group. No? And, and, and um, that is why you know, I mentioned just now that it's just a, a utopia, an imagined you know, state of perfection which is impossible to attain, impossible to achieve. Uh, uh, again, I think it's an, uh, co co a bit confusing when it's, we, we talk about multiculturalism. Okay, so you say that liberalism uh, will uh, actually um, celebrates diversity. Okay, Multi uh, liberalism celebrates uh, diversity, um, and also, but eventually uh, it will erase a certain. Um, uh, adoption or, or a racial uh, adopt, you know, adoption to you know uh, to the society. So, no, my question would be: um, some people have been using liberalism as an argument, saying that we should um, celebrate diversity, which is again okay, correct. It is following the principle of, of liberalism, in fact, but sorry. to protect yeah. the minority. So, yeah, so they are saying. For example, in Malaysia, so we're talking about other races than Malays. So they're using that argument to protect or to promote other races, uh, their rights and everything. For example, from, when we talk about Chinese, they want to um, protect their school um, education system. So they say that this is our right. So is that considered as liberalism or what? Um, this is because, yeah, it, it seems confusing because at what end, at one end, it says that as if um, everyone, uh, it is celebrated, uh, diversity is celebrated. At one end, it is saying as if like um, there should be only one um, particular um, identity for a nation. And that it shouldn't, uh, but that is not associated with any races. Yeah. So can you explain how it actually works? There's this analogy used by Dr. Hazdin in, in her writing. You use the uh, apartment analogy, uh, which I think is, is extremely suitable in expressing um, ideas about how you know, diversity should operate in a multiracial context like Malaysia. I think perhaps Dr. Shazdin can elaborate on the <laughs> idea of apartment, if not mistaken. The one you, you the speech you yeah, yeah delivered. Um, First of all, I don't think liberalism celebrates diversity. It celebrates unity. Um, it claims that it celebrates uh, diversity, but the diversity that it claims it is uniting, it, you know, it claims that it unites uh, multicultural uh, people across you know, different backgrounds of uh, cultures, races, religion. If and only, and this is my argument, that if and only if uh, the people under it are liberal themselves or submit to the liberal way of life. I mean, you can be a Muslim, but you can be a liberal at the same time. What does it mean, though? Um, it means that you're <laughs> a secular, right? I mean, you, you're just limiting your faith um, and religion uh, in, a, in a private, you know, in a, uh, privately, right? Um, but everything else outside of it, you would probably, you know, submit to the liberal way of life. Um, so the diversity or the um, unity that it 
claims is for people who are already liberal or can actually accept liberalism as their ideology, even though they claim themselves as Muslim or even if they have uh, Chinese roots or Indian and so on, if you get what I mean. So I, I don't think it, it again, it's, it's the utopia that it trying to, you know, uh, send the send the message to people that okay, uh, you know, adopt liberalism as as uh, you know as a multicultural um, tool, you know, for I think maybe we can say that actually liberalism is not actually what they usually. I mean, liberalism eventually is not as what they preach they are actually. So, for example, they might say that they promote diversity, but in the end, it's actually it's actually not. They are actually just promoting one kind of ideology which is liberal so um, that is not diversity right no and yeah i mean you already see this uh in in france i mean some can argue that france is not a liberal state but i mean it <laughs> it came from a you know a, a liberal a liberal ideology uh you know the essence or the the origins came from you know the age, the age of enlightenment was was in france wasn't it yeah so i mean with France right now, uh, you know, with with the issue of I'm bringing this up again, with the issue of uh, burkini uh, or, or wearing the burqa, even you know, so it's it's not in the in the ideology of liberalism of freedom, right? So liberalism or people who are liberal do not think that this is freedom, and so uh, you know they are penalizing women who choose so to cover themselves that, up. That that issue is also. Confusing because which freedom that we are celebrating now? Oh, exactly, that, yeah. that's my point. Is so it the, the freedom, freedom, you know, if they believe that women should be um, exposed, or is it freedom for that Muslim woman to dress as how she wants? Exactly. So the freedom that they are imp imposing uh, or imposing upon uh, those who do not agree on their type of freedom uh, is exactly that. I mean, uh, you know, pen uh, in in France's case, penalization, but. Um, in other in other uh, societies, liberal societies, you know, some would be ostracized or being rejected or deemed as um, backward. You know, they're not really socially fully accepted by the liberal society. You know, it it's when you are, you know, fully liberal that you can actually uh, integrate yourself uh, into the liberal society. And the apartment analogy was uh, a case where. My argument is that uh, a better solution for multicultural or for unity in a multicultural society is Islam, where uh, in the past, in the in the past, in the system of the past, uh, where Islam was at the top of uh, civilization. Okay, uh, we can refer to that as the golden era. Uh, you can see that people of uh, different culture, different religion, different faith can actually live together side by side. Uh, Prosperously, you know, they don't have to um, be Muslims, okay, but they can actually they can actually live in their own community, uh, with their own um, language, their own food, their own identity, without any interruption. They can actually, you know, practice their faith without any, um, yeah, uh, in interruption from from uh, the Islamic government. It's it's just that they have to adhere to um, uh, certain state laws that. Islamic, uh, the, the, the Islamic government, uh, you know, uh, imposes uh, to everyone, including Muslims themselves. So the apartment analogy, sorry, I'm just get going to that, is that Islam is the, um, or the Islamic laws, Islamic government is the owner of a building where it houses uh, apartments, right? Small apartments, apartments uh, of different. Uh, people who have different faiths and religion, and they can all have their own rules in their apartment, uh, provided that they adhere to, this, the, to the common rule um, that the apartment uh, uh, owner um, uh, gives out. So my argument was that, that it is possible to actually live under the same uh, society or country where people can actually practice or have their own identities um, and you know, they don't have to actually uh, live, uh, you know, in a raceless society where th there's no identity or there's no value that they have been holding on to um, when it comes to uh, liberalism uh, or, or in a in a liberal um, 
uh, when they are government, they are, when they are governed by a liberal, uh, you know, party or or, or, or state. Um, so that 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 was what where I was going, especially in that um, uh, ideas forum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's quite interesting because if you were to sum up that point um, in the end, okay, if we have a building, an apartment building, um, so if the the building is actually Islam, or the owner is actually Islam, then everyone living in the, apart uh, the apartments can actually live peacefully. But if it's not Islam, I mean liberal, if it's liberal, then everyone will not live peacefully. And can you elaborate on that? Why is it that? Oh, yeah, because she said that in the end, because everyone needs to be liberal rather than being themselves. So that is the problem. So as I said, Actually, yeah, if you were to um, conclude about liberalism, they preach that they promote diversity, but in the end, yeah, it's actually not. They are just promoting liberal ideas, and they want everyone to become liberal. All right, so, am I right? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. So, um, so we have asked um, um, Farami about the, the flaws uh, uh, in, uh, of liberal, liberalism, in addressing multiculturalism. So now, um, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Hazlim, how can liberal doctrine impact our effort in building an Islamic nation? And how can Islam, as opposed to liberal idea, can be a better alternative uh, for a multicultural religion? So the, the basis of um, liberalism uh, and I've touched upon this uh, just now, the basis of liberalism that we are so against as Muslims is because that they, the, the liberalism's usage of human or the individual as the sole making, uh, sole decision-making faculty, right? Everything is up to the individual to decide. Um, when clearly in Islam, uh, it's not the case. We have Allah as our highest reference and not the individual. We have uh, the Quran that uh, Allah has bestowed upon us. We have uh, the Sunnah, okay, uh, where uh, given by the Rasulullah Sallallahu where Allah has appointed him as the messenger. So we have this reference that are not uh, that cannot change, okay. That's already uh, been determined, okay. Um, and we we as Muslims believe that it is the truth, and we we need to adhere to that. Whereas for liberalism, it subjects the individual and human as uh, the sole decision uh, maker. And this can change over time, right? We can see the morality changes and that will just follow whatever um, the individual wants or needs. Um, yeah, for example, like in the West previously, they, they are uh, very Christian, but nowadays they are more secular. So yeah, because of the liberal idea that they adopt, it changes the social um, uh, picture of how the society behaves. Yeah, mor morality changes uh, over time according to the human, uh, according to, to, to their time. For example, L uh, LGBT wasn't really um, accepted, uh, even in the West, uh, decades ago. But right now, it's being trying to be seen as a, a normal, uh, a normal situation. You know, which. A human can can you know uh, orient its sexual uh, his or her sexuality to, so it changes right. And um, if you submit or if you subscribe to the liberal ideology, um, then you know you wouldn't have any problems with uh, LGBT because you know on on the name of uh, uh, in the name of equality right and human rights for example sex, same sex marriage, you need to actually subscribe to the liberal ideology to actually accept that you know. But as a Muslim, you can't because it's already outlined clearly that Islam rejects homosexuality. Um, how do you go about that when you call yourself a liberal Muslim? Which, which, you know, which, which side do you want to take on? Because you know, some, some Muslims claim themselves as, as that, right? Liberal Muslim. So how is that possible? And it, it will be possible if, okay, you can either go this way. You can either actually, as a Muslim, obviously, reject the notion of homosexuality and obviously same-sex marriage. Or you can go the other way around, okay, I actually uh, accept 
same-sex marriage in the name of uh, freedom of uh, expression, in the name of equality, but I'm still a Muslim. And, and for that, I think you, only, you can actually be secular, you know, uh, for you to adopt that. But to be, <laughs> although it's really par paradoxical, or very, uh, you know, sort of hypocritical, right, for you to, you know, have those, those two uh, ideas, uh, and it clashes. And that, that itself is evident um, of how, you know, if you go back to the fundamental aspect, it, it, it just clashes. Liberalism and um, Islam or religion is, is just incom incompatible. But, so it, but in fact, I think the idea itself is, it will clash. I mean, for um, people who advocate for LGBT rights, they would say that, um, yeah, it is okay. It is individual right. But for Muslim, when they, if they want to believe that this is not right, then it is wrong for them. Why is it? But I mean, ideologically, I mean, fundamentally, liberalism say that everyone should have the right to express their own beliefs. But then, when Muslim believe would want to believe that this is wrong or this is not right, it is considered wrong in liberal um, for for liberalists. So yeah. It's the the idea itself is flawed. So, not just saying that you know uh, it clashes with Islam, but the idea itself as an ideology is flawed. So, yeah, um, you may want to uh, explain more on you know some examples of what had been happening around. Um, okay, uh, so that's just okay. That that's that's LG, LGBT. I mean, there are so many, right? Uh, for example, sexual intercourse, you know, outside marriage. It's already known that it's, it's like a normal, uh, normal, you know, situation when in, in, in a liberal society, but clearly it's not in, in Islam. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's one example. I mean, you have so many. Um, if you want to argue against, you know, what what uh, a Muslim, uh, how you can actually argue, okay, uh, it's my right to. There's so many things. The, if you get, yeah. you get yeah, even like pedophile or what do you call that? Yeah, yeah we have not actually can, reached that stage yeah. yet where pedophilia it, it is, is going towards that yeah. direction. Yeah. Uh, there's a. Is it in Germany or? Uh, I'm that sure. <laughs> uh, in incestuous uh, relationship is seen as oh, something okay. that can be allowed. I, I yeah. can't remember wh where exactly yeah. it is, but I mean, w right now, even in even in um, even amongst liberals, right yeah. now, it's not seen as something that's uh, normal, yeah. right? But we don't know in the future where you know morality changes over time according to yeah. the individual human, um, you know, decision yeah. making. Yeah, and for the worst, it could be with animals, right? So, yeah, <laughs> because yeah. it's the same idea. Whether they want to accept or not, it is just the matter of time. Yeah, that will decide. Yeah, okay. So I, I've already argued as well uh, on your second part of, of the question uh, of how uh, liberalism is problematic in terms of it really just cancel out your identity and your values that you have hold on to, and it's very. Um, Problematic in, 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 in Malaysia, where it's very multicultural, and we have our own set of unique identities and values that we adhere to, not just as Muslims, but as uh, you know, as Chinese, as Indians, as as the indigenous uh, population of Malaysia. We all have actually our own set of values that that can actually uh, go against what liberalism is uh, trying to promote. <laughs> Sex outside marriage. I mean, it does not. Nobody actually, even even from the um, conservative tra traditional uh, Chinese community or whoever in Malaysia would not accept as it is being normal, but it is very normal in the liberal um, society. So, and you know, there are a whole lot of other values that can actually clash against liberalism. And being um, Malaysia, and I know um, uh, Malaysia is still very, very uh, conservative and traditional. Okay, but how as how uh, um, uh, Farmi Ahmad uh, Farmi has mentioned that um, you know it's being portrayed that it's actually you know a, a majority uh, voice when it's clearly not. It's just a, 
a, a small number of uh, people who are trying to really uh, aggressively out loud trying to promote that um, liberal ideology and how Islam is, is I was arguing a better solution for it because in the past system, and you, know, you can actually refer to the past where Islam was really on the top, where it welcomes uh, people of uh, different uh, religion, different cultures, different faith to uh, live under the Islamic system, uh, even though they're, they themselves are not Muslims. I mean, we would be happy if they are, but I mean, if they choose not to, then it's okay as long as they adhere to the state uh, state laws as how Muslims and non-Muslims uh, need to, you know, as other, any other citizen needs to uh, adhere to. Um, but can you actually implement such a system in Malaysia? That, that's another different question. Are we not that Islam Islamic yet? I mean, because we we proclaim that we are an Islamic country, and also different races have been living in Malaysia, and we believe that you know we, we are practicing Islam. So, uh, how do you see that? Are we actually? Because you are saying as if like we are not there yet, or actually have we practiced it or? Have we? Have we? <laughs> if you, if you look at the legislation itself, I mean, you know, clearly uh, we have a lot, long way to go, right, towards the full implementation of the Sharia law. Even when uh, uh, Abdul Hadi wanted to actually um, bring, you know, the hooded bill as a private bill, we have received so many objections towards it. You know, it's a long way to go to have uh, Islam to be fully implemented not just at the legislation level, but also the individual level. I mean, you can see so many Muslims who, are, who don't even know, um, you know their, their religion um, fully, um, more thoroughly, you know, not just as a, as a faith, of, of, uh, you know, as, a, as a personal faith, but also as a system, you know, as, as an ideology. So uh, I think to many, Islam is still, is still a, a, a blur, oh, even though um, there are actually many, um, many who are trying to, you know, uphold uh, Islam, right, as as uh, as the main religion, as the uh, as the main um, governing system. But you know, the number is still low, and you know, we are trying to increase that. And also, you know, with non-Muslims who view Islamic system as barbaric, who uh, outdated, and so on. I mean, there's a lot of lot of work to be done to revive Islam as how it should be. Um, so I think we have a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, if you want to take um, uh, an example from the history, I think the Ottoman history would be the, the best example because though we see Turkey as a country where, where and the people are Turkish, but um, historically the people under the Ottoman Empire, uh, actually, it's very diverse, you know, because they covered Europe, Asia, and um, uh, North Asia, Central Asia, and so many, so many um, countries. And these are actually of different ethnicities, and they are not Turkish, you know. Uh, the the nearest would be uh, uh, Kurdish, um, and then we have all these uh, Central Asia, Tajikistan, um, or I don't know, with, although with, with this tan tan at the back. Uh, and then we have um, even Greece were under the Ottoman Empire. So all of these are actually you know, from, from uh, different backgrounds. So it is a good example if, one is, if people question whether uh, Islam can actually um, you know, promote multiculturalism or not. So we have a clear example that it had been successful in the past. All right. Um, so we have... Um, um, uh, concluded two rounds of, of questions. Um, so in the first round, we have talked about um, uh, the definitions and the development. And in the second round, we talked about how it affects multiculturalism in Malaysia. And then now, we are more interested about the media. We want to understand how um, media is being utilized by different parties and organizations. And today, specifically, we talk about liberal and its movement. So um, we're going to ask um, Farami, can you explain the role of media 
in propagating the liberal ideas and views, and also if, uh, and more interestingly, if you can share the strategies and techniques that they use to shape the society's perceptions. Um, okay, well, the most important fact for us to consider is that media, they do not operate or exist in isolation. Their agenda, their idealism, the way they behave are closely connected to uh, notions such as ownership. You know? So the most important question to ask you know, when you are interacting with uh, such media is you know, who owns that particular media? You have to be critical um, when it comes to you know, reading their agenda. And of course, we have seen for the well, over like for the past four, five years, you know, some of the uh, news portals in Malaysia have been actively promoting and propagating ideas, which we can consider as you know being liberal in nature, and they are supporting political movements as well as um, NGOs, which we can categorize as being being liberal in their uh, agenda. And one of the ways um, of propagating ideas uh, concerning liberalism is by amplifying, uh, by reinforcing uh, the voices of um, certain you know, news sources or you know, spoke media spokesperson or um, representatives from liberal NGOs as being representative of the majority of the people. Um, and media also play an important role in creating heroes and villains in the society. You know, for example, in the case of uh, Saudari Mariam Lee, who chose to, uh, I don't know, protest against the uh, norms, uh, which are against, you know, um, people breaking past or not fasting in public. Uh, she was trying to prove that, you know, trying to prove um, a, a, you know, a, an ideological point, but the media tried to portray uh, the, you know, her image or her ideology as being the ideal ideology for Malaysia, and that the system, the authorities, the norms and values which we consider as sacred and fundamental to our national identity are considered as uh, you know being primitive, or orthodox, you know even oppressive. You know that's one of the ways media create this drama or conflict between the you know the evil force, which normally we refer to the, the so-called conservative um, values, and the heroes, which represent you know the liberal communities. People like let's say Alvin Tan has been described by um, certain news portals as being a democratic hero. People like Ali Abdul Jalil considered as um, you know, hero, as a reformist of sorts. Um, and, and this is highly problematic huh? uh, because media has that power to socialize us into thinking in you know, a certain way, to, to, to promote ideas which we might you know, internalize and learn and internalize and you know, become part of our identity. And that's highly problematic. Um, let me just share with you some of the news reports which um, were you know, in, in um, the, the liberal news portal for the past uh, few months, which I think are indicative of their agenda. Just to share a few examples, a few months ago, there were reports about how um, Sabu, Sabu Samaha Mufti, um, Kerajaan Negeri Perlis and also Kerajaan Negeri Perak have um, actually conveyed certain ideas which were deemed as being controversial. Huh? So the media came up with this, such, I mean, this type of headlines, women must give husband sex even on camels, Islamic scholar said. And another report, after a few days, Muslim husbands can't pull out during sex without wife's consent. 
And the way these news were framed, I think it's highly problematic because they tend to focus on the most bizarre, the most, you know, the, the, the wacky, the strange aspects of uh, the statements. And this has invited many comments which are cynical, which ex were extremely insulting uh, against Islam. Uh? So this is how media create Islamophobia in, 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 in perhaps, uh, you know, in a very subtle manner and sometimes even blatantly supporting Islamophobia. So I think there must be some kind of awareness or media literacy uh, um, among the, uh, the, 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 the members of the public uh, when, when interacting with such media. And um, another way uh, of making a particular statement look really important or significant is by focusing on, let's say, sources which are vague and ambiguous. Huh? For example, they will always use the terms like critics. Critics say that you know, um, you know, the Malaysia is 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 backward in terms of its Islamic approach. Critics, it's it's a mysterious concept, you know. But the way they put it is as if um, the critics are, you know, speaking on behalf of the uh, Malay majority, huh? and that's one of the ideological function of media, huh? trying to paint such picture. The media do not only tell us what to think about, you know, through such framing techniques, they also teach us, teach us how to think about a particular issue. Not only how, what to think, but how to think about, let's say, Islamic values, about, uh, you know, Islamic principles uh, as implemented uh, in the country. So I think that's, that's highly problematic. Okay. Do you, do, you, do you want to share more examples of of how the media have been um, misleading the public, especially on the issues relating, you know, with, uh, Islam or Islamic scholars or? Um, I remember when there was this case involving a particular campaign, um, touch the drop campaign. Yes, that's that's yeah, the campaign. Uh, media tried to promote this idea that you know we're living in a conservative society that touching the dog is haram, but that's not the whole you know concern. I'm actually, we were more concerned about the way media or the campaign tried to naturalize you know dog touching. But the way media tried to divert attention is by focusing on unrelated matters. Huh? Um, in rhetorics, it is called red herring, trying to divert our attention from the real issue. Uh, for example, there was this report about how, you know, we should focus, be focusing more on, you know, the more important issues like menyebar video lucha instead of being too concerned about touching a dog. Uh, that is a fallacy. Yeah? That's, that's what we call a false comparison. Mm -hmm. um, comparing two different items or ideas which are unrelated, you know, these items should be evaluated on its, you know, on merits. Huh? So that's one of the ways uh, using such fallacies. And um, another report said that um, touching a dog, sentuh uh, anjing tak haram, according to bekas uh, mufti. Uh, Dr. Mazza Kini Mufti uh, Perlis, uh, back then was uh, Bekas Mufti. Uh, I think that was not the issue, but the media tried to divert our attention by, by, by focusing on such matter. Sentuh anjing bukan, tidak haram is not actually the main concern. We know that there is a khilaf you know, between different mazhabs. Huh? But uh, we were more concerned about how such campaigns, um, you know, looking at the big picture, might, you know, naturalize the idea of, you know, touching a dog, you know, that it's, 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 it's okay to touch a dog, you know, this naturalizing um, uh, process, I think that's problematic. Hmm. So, yeah, I think the, the effect, I think the effect of, of, of such event, and there was an interesting uh, event happened in the past. Um, uh, it's not, uh, it's okay to touch a dog, but it's it happened to be like you must touch a dog, yeah. So that's how the media worked. Um, you know, it 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 portrays certain um, 
uh, understand. Oh, I mean, it, it teaches this, the society on how, how to behave, on how to think. And that is actually very, very dangerous. Um, so that is, that is a very interesting um, sharing from, from um, Farami. Um, I think um, academically there should be other terminologies. You know, um, I, I, I read your post previously, talk about isolation, uh, what else? Um, uh, yeah, all these fallacies are about, uh, it's very academic. So <laughs> yeah, so all these different techniques or strategies that, that, that the media use to, to uh, assert certain uh, views or ideas. Okay, um, we will continue again with um, Dr. Hazlin. Um, so I think she has a personal experience um, facing the media. Um, she recently attended the Forum by Ideas and as I, I mentioned earlier uh, in the forum, uh, she has been portrayed um, in the Chinese um, press as saying, um, as if, like she said, I, I'm not sure if she said that, um, freedom, sorry, what was that? Peace uh, can only be achieved if non-Muslims, uh, non freedom is restricted, something like that, okay? So, as if like, you know, it sounds so negative. Um, so. I want to ask you, um, yeah, can you actually share your experience uh, and how the media had actually misquoted and used your script to express different arguments? And uh, what do you think that they wish to achieve from, from this, actually? Okay. Uh, the whole situation made me think that, my goodness, um, you know, I don't want to be a politician because, you know, whatever statement that you make can be easily, so easily manipulated. And people can actually really react to it um, very aggressively. Uh, and also, you know, they are so overcome with the emotions just by reading a particular article that is um, claiming against something, something when it's not really true. I believe that there were many people who tried to add you on Facebook. <laughs> yes, yes. I was so overwhelmed by that uh, as well. And I don't know, I, I, think, my, I, I, I think myself as an, in, an introvert, so it, you know, for this to occur is a bit of a shock to me. But it's OK. Such is life, right? Um, so the forum itself was a very civil discourse. Okay? It was calm and all that. It only happened. Uh, chaos only happened when the media started to actually misquoted uh, or you know yeah misquoted me. Um, the 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 headline itself, uh, I think it was from Free Malaysia Today. I think if I'm mistaken, was very very misleading. Uh, it says Ismail rejects freedom of ex uh, speech and expression. Uh, so this really just one it's misleading and it's totally untrue, and it gives. Uh, the convenience for people who don't really read the article or don't go to the forum thinking that, oh, wow, Isma really rejects all sorts of freedom and rights and so on. So <laughs> that itself is, is you know, problematic, okay? Because it has that power to actually convince people just from the headline. And with the Chinese media, I, I can't read Chinese if you don't have Chinese, um, that uh, Isma rejects uh, freedom of speech uh, from non-Muslims, right? Something like that, something along the line. Just because I used the example of Alvin Tan, because he's a Chinese, but I actually also mentioned Ali Abdul Jale, who's a Malay. So it, it's nothing about that at all. You know, the, whatever argument that I was trying to bring forth, that liberalism does not promote multiculturalism, was not really, you know, highlighted. The racial sentiment behind that, or the 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 trying to, to portray Isma as you know, being anti-freedom anti is, is the main highlight of, of how media is trying to you know, portray Isma as. So this is just a propaganda, I mean, you know, to, to have those who are neutral, uh, to see Isma or whatever Isma is trying to bring forth or its arguments, you know, trying to reject all of that, okay? Um, or no matter how academic it is, you know, how academic you try to bring our arguments, uh, just reject that, you know, from, from media, um, media propagation, media narrative of who Isma is and who, um, uh, so I think they're trying to categorize Isma 
as um, being uh, and also Jakim and also uh, Jais and so on being the you know the authoritarian or authoritative figures of uh, or not someone who actually represents state state religion right that the one that they really um, uh, opposed opposed to um, so they, they what they do is they just cherry pick what they want to highlight. Um, spin it around and you know call it journalism. I think it's, it's a disgrace. Okay, and I don't think that's how uh, journalism should be. I don't know. If, uh, Jemma Farini may, maybe have a. I don't know. It, it's a tool. It's, it's definitely a tool for for propaganda, yeah. right? And and the the problem is that many people are so easily duped, so easily, um, yeah. Um, Confused or actually believed into into such a uh, narrative that they are trying to portray. You know, some some would believe every story that they claim without even you know doing a double check uh, or, or studying or investigating further, and that's very 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 worrying. I I actually had a a, a, a chat or, or communicated with someone who really based all of his arguments on what he read on media, on liberal media. Um, and what comes out of, of, of his mouth, or of, of the conversation, is just really accusations upon accusations, and just really, um, you can't actually even rationally discuss with him because he was really, you know, so overcome with emotions from what he and read or whatever from the that media. he read became, became some sort of like, um, uh, source uh, reference exactly yeah. source of reference when the thing is <laughs> it's it's really biased right it's really biased and you know because they cherry pick and they don't really portray the whole uh, argument or the whole picture then it's really easy for someone to be um, I guess uh, you know uh, tricked into that and and forming all of the arguments based only on that when the thing is, if you actually try to um, understand, try to discuss further, try to investigate, then you would actually see the whole picture rather than you know certain parts that are being um, you know focused on uh, that that leads to the bias, right? And we also have this the recent, the very recent uh, comment by a popular social activist on on an, another article from uh, Malaysia Online, okay. Uh, on on the rang uh, undang three tiga uh, lima kan are you uh, by uh, Haji Amiruddin kan uh, he was saying that I mean the the, the article was trying to uh, say or trying to uh, really emphasize that oh uh, Isma only sees punishment as the only resort and that is you know sort of being reiterated by that social activist. Um, so this is clearly a distortion because you know never has Isma actually said that oh we just need punishment for as to as a way to um, control uh, or control uh, Zina for example right we have actually uh, uh, focused much of our effort on education we have campaigns to say no to Zina campaign we have the conferences on uh, Konwanis. Uh, that educates on uh, the Muslim empowerment. We actually also went down to a, a, a secondary school to educate um, young girls on on their dignity and their uh, awrat and so and, and, and how they should behave and so on. So to just base your argument in saying that oh you know um, Isma is just focusing on punishment just because of that article is really um, really problematic. So I guess from from your experience, in the end, whatever that you discussed in the forum is it really doesn't matter because in the end, what is reported in the media is going to actually influence whatever that people want to believe or people you know would like to hear about. So it is very very um, 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 serious, I think. Um, but I don't know whether is it actually we should accept that you know people are will behave in such a way. Um, that we should, in the end, um, improve um, journalism uh, ethics, or actually we should actually educate the public to to become more um, uh, to become more um, investigative in whatever that they read. So yeah, maybe you want to share to be yeah. more literate, to be to yeah. have media literacy. I think okay. that's, that's 
an important skill to have you uh -huh. know, during these times. So that's one of the ways to, to handle this problem, to educate the public uh, um, so that they have that kind of literacy. I think that's one of the most fundamental skills nowadays. You know, so I think that, that is something that no one has tried to address. Um, we, are, we are trying to, to develop modules and um, you know, approaches and strategies in educating the masses about the importance of having media liter literacy at IJS or UITM. So we are trying to address this concern, actually. Um, we know that this is, um, you know, it's high time for us to have uh, such modules uh, to educate the public. As I said just now, public needs to be educated uh, to, you know, to have um, that kind of frame of mind whenever they interact with media to, to, to identify the, the, the credibility, the sources of the information, the context of information which they are getting. Um, if I can share some of the steps, you know, to develop such literacy, um, apart from being able to identify, you know, the ownership of the media, it is also important for them to identify the context of the discussion. In the case of Dr. Hasdin, I think your statement was taken out of context. They cherry-picked, you know, and, and they only took that particular part, and they frame it in such a way that, you know, it represents Isma in a negative light. So I think, you know, somebody who is literate media-wise you know, will also try to refer to other sources of news, information, to compare uh, between what has been reported by the news portal and perhaps another more credible news source, or even try to seek information from ISMA huh, uh, itself. Um, so fact-checking is important. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the bayun is also important, menyelidik maklumat, you know, to compare, uh, you know, perspectives and, you know, different sources of information in order to arrive at a conclusion, you know, to understand what is the, the, the truth. Uh, it's not that easy, actually, nowadays. You know, people manufacture truths, uh, and many half-truths have been reported, uh, and fallacies. Um, so that's part of, you know, what we call media literacy. And, and there's also a need you know, for the public to understand the differences between facts and opinion. Facts and how the journalists interpret the facts. There's you know, a big difference between interpretation of facts and facts themselves. You know? So, um, and interpretation of facts can be done in several ways. Huh? One of the ways is through you know, framing the news in such a way that it is consistent with the agenda of the uh, news portals. If, let's say, their utopia or the agenda, the idealism, is to see Malaysia turning into a secular state, of course, they will try to only pick, you know, stories which will be, you know, supporting that kind of agenda, that kind of view. So you have to, you know, be able to identify the ideological, you know, agenda of that particular uh, news portal, and based on the previous reporting, you need to also see the patterns of their reporting, you know, the way they frame news and uh, project their ideologies. So that's basically what media literacy is. Um, yeah, and it's, it's extremely crucial for the public to, to have such skills. Thank you. I guess it should start from, from school, from a very, very young yeah, age. Yeah, from very yeah. young. Because sure. I, if, if, when you talk about that, I remember when I was in primary, when we learned about, you know, referencing or trying to find information the newspaper we were thought to be uh, to take it as you know as the source <laughs> so we thought you know it's the authority you know we believe in that uh, you don't question it but it's actually a secondary um, information it's not a primary information so yeah it's very interesting to to uh, discuss on that okay so we have um, um, discussed so many things. Um, I think we should go to the conclusion of the forum. Um, and uh, I would like to um, uh, invite our panelists to share. Um, first of all, I, uh, I will um, invite Farami to conclude your opinion on whether the liberal movement is a real threat to multicultural Malaysia. 
I, I think um, apart from you know thinking of liberalism in terms of being a threat or solution uh, to uh, a multi multiracial, multicultural Malaysia, uh, we should go beyond that by looking at um, problems related to liberalism as it relates to our federal constitution, whether it's uh, compatible or not, uh, as far as cultural our cultural values and ethical norms are concerned. So. Using that kind of approach, I would say that um, liberalism is clearly incompatible hmm, with our ethical norms and our you know, cultural values. Um, and in, in that sense, it, it poses a, a threat. Although it, it is coming from an, I would say, insignificant you know, a, a minority or small group of people, but uh, their voices, again, as I said just now, have been amplified eh, over and over again. And uh, that is, um, I think, um, very destructive to our national unity and it's very um, uh, counterproductive uh, to our national unity and also our nation building. Uh, so liberalism is obviously an antithesis to our cultural values and looking at it critically, it is even un constitutional because it is not reflective of what we you know stand for no? our aspirations our federal constitution islam as the religion of federation um, it, it doesn't address these fundamental aspects of malaysia no? it is an antithesis to what malaysia stands for i think that's that's my conclusion thank you for me um, and lastly dr Habilin, um how should Muslims and, in fact, other Malaysians uh, in general should react to all this liberal propagation? Uh, and what would be the best way, do you think, uh, to unite everyone uh, in the country? So we all, um, we Malaysians, need to take everything with a grain of salt, meaning we need to be skeptic you know, to whatever that's laid out in front of us, okay, and just don't take everything at face value. Um, this is so true for all of the, you know, media propagations, any any propagation really. So we need to have that, you know, frame of mind, not just to have, you know, to take, accept everything, but to really um, have some form of uh, uh, mature judgment, okay, and, um, and by that I mean investigating thoroughly, uh, or going to a discussion or forum, you know, to discuss more on it. Um, going to our history, even you know, don't leave our rich history behind. Um, that actually uh, made how Islam, for example, the religion of federation, how um, uh, how Paramasora has accepted Islam, how um, Malay civilization has developed not just throughout Malaya but also throughout the region of Southeast Asia. How Chinese and Indians have migrated or immigrated and their struggle and also the indigenous population. I mean, these all need to be taken into context. And I think if we really see that, um, uh, you know, Malaysia as a whole, I think we can actually uh, truly accept one another, okay, and, and have this important element called respect. Um, the Constitution of Malaysia provides uh, a great tool or a basis for unity, actually, um, across every one of different cultures, different uh, race, different religion. Okay, so I think if, if everyone actually respects it and uh, upholds it, rather than re uh, challenging it, right? I think it's it's it it can create a, a, a tool or a, a basis, and we, we don't have much problem in uniting people of different backgrounds. Having said that, though, you know, as a Muslim, I think, uh, and, and I've argued uh, uh, and brought forth my argument that there's no doubt, uh, as Muslims, that the best way to unite people is actually having Islam uh, at the top, right? Islam as, as, as uh, how it governed the society uh, in the past. And, but there are so many gaps for us to fulfill as Muslims and uh, as a society, uh, uh, as, as an individual in a society, and this is where we all should actually, as Muslims, uh, work towards, right? Yeah, thank you so much. All right, um, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, so before 
we end our session. Let me just try to conclude again what we have achieved in this forum tonight. One, we have um, defined and understood um, liberalism and its context in Malaysia and its development. Um, and secondly, we have discussed about multiculturalism and how Islam can actually promote a better version of multiculturalism compared to liberalism. And we believe that liberalism cannot actually um, uh, promote um, the true, uh, a true multiculturalism. And also we have discussed about the role of media and how the liberals have been using the media um, uh, exhaustively uh, to, to, um, to uh, promote their uh, agenda or ideas and views. Uh, and also we have understood that there is an importance of uh, Muslims to be media literal, to understand, media literate, yeah, media literate. To, to understand whatever that they read uh, or, or see and hear and listen um, uh, from the media. Um, so uh, we, go, as, uh, we hope that this forum has been um, um, meaningful to everyone. Um, and we hope that it doesn't end here um, because in the end, it is, um, as it says, Surah Pandang, Suara Baru Ummah. Uh, Suara Baru Ummah. Uh, what is it? The new voice of the Ummah. So it means that whatever that we have discussed is not to end here, but it is something for us to bring back home and take some action from it. And with that, I conclude. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.